Approximately 95% of adult hemoglobin is comprised of hemoglobin A in hematologically normal individuals. While hemoglobin A2 and very low levels of fetal hemoglobin make up the lesser extent of the remaining hemoglobin species. Hemoglobin A1C makes up approximately 80% of hemoglobin A1. While there are various terms for glycated hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C is the internationally accepted term for reporting all glycated hemoglobin test results. The formation of hemoglobin A1C occurs in humans at a slow rate as a post-translational modification of hemoglobin throughout the life of the red cell. Hemoglobin A1C is formed by the non-enzymatic reaction of glucose with the amino terminal valine residues of the beta chains of hemoglobin A. Glucose binds reversibly to hemoglobin as an aldamine or shift base. This adduct then undergoes an amidory rearrangement to form a stable ketoamine. The formation of the stable ketoamine is irreversible. The concentration of hemoglobin A1C depends on several factors. The major determining factors are the lifespan of the red blood cell and how long the hemoglobin molecule is exposed to glucose. It is also thought that the permeability of the red blood cell to glucose influences the amount of glycation. In general, it is accepted that hemoglobin A1C concentrations represent average glucose levels over the preceding 8 to 12 weeks. This is precluded, however, in patients who have underlying anemias, hemolysis, vitamin B12 or folate deficiencies, hemoglobinopathies, or hemoglobin variants, all of which may alter the lifespan of the red blood cell and therefore the accumulated concentration of hemoglobin A1C in the red blood cell. It has long been known that increasing amounts of hemoglobin A1C correlate with diabetes complications. Regression models from the Diabetes Complication and Control Trial quantify these relationships. These analyses indicate that the risk associated with any given mean hemoglobin A1C changes as a function of time. The risk of retinopathy progression at any point in time that is associated with any given level of the mean hemoglobin A1C increases with years of follow-up. The analysis shows that as total glycemic exposure increases, retinopathy progression increases. There was a 60% reduction in the development or progression of diabetic retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy between the intensively treated group where the mean hemoglobin A1C achieved was approximately 7%, and the standard group's mean hemoglobin A1C of 9% over an average of six and a half years. Furthermore, for any given value of the updated mean hemoglobin A1C, the risk increases with time. It is data from this trial along with others, such as the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study that ultimately placed the importance of a target hemoglobin A1C value for diabetic patients in efforts to reduce their risk of complications as a result of the disease. Hemoglobin A1C is an analyte used for monitoring average glycemia in diabetic patients over time. After the DCCT and UK PDS trials, it was clear there was a direct relationship between hemoglobin A1C and mean blood glucose. Until recently, however, there were not any reliable regression equations available to calculate an estimated average glucose, or EAG. The following table shows the relationship between hemoglobin A1C and estimated average glucose in a study sponsored by the American Diabetes Association and European Association for the Study of Diabetes. The major advantage to reporting hemoglobin A1C as an estimated average glucose is that both physicians and patients understand glucose values. Diabetic patients are familiar with dealing with glucose values from their home glucose meters. Of note, the correlation of hemoglobin A1C and estimated average glucose is only an estimate. For example, a hemoglobin A1C of 7% 
equates to an estimated average glucose of 154 milligrams per deciliter. However, the estimated average glucose is anywhere from 123 to 185 milligrams per deciliter with 95% confidence. The potential clinical and analytical implications for interpreting estimated average glucose in this context are not yet understood. Reporting of the estimated average glucose, however, has been endorsed by several clinical groups, such as the ADA, EASD, International Diabetes Foundation, and the American Association for Clinical Chemistry. Based on recent College of American Pathologists survey data, approximately 29 hemoglobin A1C methods from 10 manufacturers are currently in use in clinical laboratories. Most methods can be classified into one of two groups according to assay principle. The first group uses methods that measure hemoglobin A1C on the basis of charge differences between glycated and non-glycated components, which includes cation exchange chromatography. The second group uses methods that separate components on the basis of structural differences. Examples include boronate affinity chromatography and immunoassay. Most charge-based and immunoassay methods quantify hemoglobin A1C, which is defined as hemoglobin A with glucose attached to the N-terminal valine of one or both hemoglobin A chains. Boronate affinity methods detect not only hemoglobin A1C, but also other amino group glucose adducts, such as glucose lysine adducts and glucose chain N-terminal valine adducts. It should also be mentioned that hemoglobin A1C point-of-care analyzers are available. However, they are not sufficiently accurate or precise enough at this time to be used for diagnosis of diabetes and should not be used for this purpose. Data from the CAP glycohemoglobin proficiency testing survey shows the distributions of methodologies used for measuring hemoglobin A1C. The ADA recommends that all laboratories performing testing participate in the CAP accuracy-based proficiency testing survey for hemoglobin A1C, which uses fresh, whole blood samples. It was noticed shortly after the DCCT and UKPDS trials that hemoglobin A1C results reported in clinical laboratories for the same blood sample could differ considerably among methods. Therefore, standardization efforts were established on both the national and international levels. In 1996, the NGSP was initiated to standardize test results among laboratories to DCCT equivalent values. In 1997, the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry formed a committee to develop a higher order reference method and reference materials for hemoglobin A1C analysis reference HPLC mass spectrometry and HPLC capillary electrophoresis methods were approved in 2001. Although the clinical values obtained with assays standardized with the reference IFCC method correlate well with NGSP values, the absolute hemoglobin A1C values reported differ by 1.5 to 2% hemoglobin A1C. The relationship between NGSP network and IFCC networks was evaluated and a master equation was developed to document this relationship. In 2007, the IFCC recommended that IFCC hemoglobin A1C be expressed as millimoles hemoglobin A1C per mole of hemoglobin. With these new units, the master equation changed, thereby avoiding any confusion between NGSP and IFCC results. The NGSP and CAP have tightened the criteria for manufacturer certification in efforts to further decrease measurement variability. Because of this, emphasis has been placed on manufacturers to improve the accuracy and precision of hemoglobin A1C assays. Almost all hemoglobin A1C methods in clinical laboratories in the United States are certified by the NGSP. These standardization efforts have helped to lead the ADA and the World Health Organization to include hemoglobin A1C as the preferred test for the diagnosis of diabetes. For more details, please see the Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on the diagnosis of diabetes. In addition to the standardization efforts of hemoglobin A1C measurement, a main advantage to hemoglobin A1C testing as a measure of average glycemia 
is that the results are not affected significantly by acute fluctuations in blood glucose concentrations, such as those occurring with illness or after meals. The main advantage to hemoglobin A1C testing for diagnosis is that the results do not require fasting. Several hemoglobin variants, as well as carbamylated hemoglobin, may interfere with some assay methods, independently of any effects due to shortened red blood cell survival. As shown by this slide's hypothetical HPLC analysis, depending on the particular hemoglobin variant and assay method, hemoglobin A1C results can be either falsely increased or falsely decreased. For more information on method-specific interferences of hemoglobin variants, visit the NGSP website. Given that interferences are method-specific, product instructions from the manufacturer should be reviewed before the hemoglobin A1C assay method is used. In addition, when selecting an assay method, a laboratory should consider characteristics of the patient population served. If altered red blood cell turnover interferes with the relationship between mean blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C values, or if a suitable assay method is not available for interfering hemoglobin variants, alternative non-hemoglobin-based methods for assessing average glycemia, such as the fructosamine assay, may be useful. There are several key points to remember about hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C is formed from a non-enzymatic reaction between glucose and free N-terminal valine groups on the beta chain of the hemoglobin A molecule. Its concentrations depend on the amount of glucose exposure to red blood cells over the lifespan of the red blood cell. Increasing hemoglobin A1C levels correlate with diabetic complications, such as retinopathy, as was demonstrated in the DCCT and UK PDS trials. National and international standardization efforts together have paved the way towards accurate and precise hemoglobin A1C measurement. The majority of assays used to measure hemoglobin A1C currently are dependent on either charge or structure. Each of these methodologies has both advantages and limitations which should be understood before implementation in the clinical laboratory.